Uh, let's see. There we go. Hey, everybody. Um, wow, Zoom looks different today. They've added a bunch of new features. Um, let's see. Let me open, unmute Liz. Unmute Jeannie, unmute Ann. Okay. Unmute Peter. Um, let's see. How do I unmute Peter right here? Admit all. Let's see. Where's Peter? Unmute Peter Frank. Where is Peter? Okay, so unmute Jeannie. Unmute, unmute. Okay. We're almost here, guys. Okay, so I'm going to keep admitting all. I should have, excuse me, I should have. All right. Okay, so it's 12.59, so we've got a couple of seconds before we're going to start. Let's see, who do we have? Do we have Jeannie here? We got Peter, we've got Liz. Um, we're waiting for Shana and Ann. I'm here. Oh, hey, there you, there you are. Good to see you. Um, okay, so hey there, Shana. All right, so welcome everybody. It's one o'clock. We'll get started right on time, German style. Um, so, um, I invited you, all the writers here, because I wanted um, to get your perspective on what's going on. What are you writing about? And um, what we, who we have in the panel today was we have um, Jeannie Davis, we have Liz Goldner, who originally suggested the panel in the first place. We have Ann Wallentine, Shannon Niestembro, Peter Frank, and a whole bunch of cool people watching. Hey, Os. Hey, Lily. How's everybody doing? Um, uh, the first thing I wanted to start out with is a little demo. Um, I get the art newspaper. They, they, they can't get it at the LA County Museum of Art, LACMA, or Hauser & Wirth anymore because they lost their, their Los Angeles distributor. So you have to get it in the, in the mail. And this, this month's issue just came to me yesterday. I just took it out of the wrapper. And it's about a third the size of last month's issue. And we all know why. So with that note, <laughs> I wanted to start. And uh, let's start with Liz. Um, how are you, how is y your writing practice going while under, let me admit a bunch of more people. I forgot, I shouldn't have done the waiting room. But anyway. Um, we got a lot of people showing up today. This is great. So Liz, why don't you start off by um, talking about what's going on with you in your, in your writing life? Okay. Um, as a writer, you, you sent me in advance these questions. So I actually wrote some of them out. <laughs> so if it looks like I'm reading, I apologize, but I want to make sure that I'm clear in what I'm saying. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, so it's actually on the screen, so I'm not looking like I'm reading. But uh, in early March, when one art venue after another was closing, I was in a kind of shock for a while and then felt like I was grieving for my life as it had been, which was filled with seeing art exhibitions and attending events, and especially with dialoguing on a regular basis with artists and art supporters. I filled that gap in my life by reading and watching the news voraciously, because I've been a long time uh, news junkie. And I soon realized that this era that we're living in is my first taste of, you know, of what it's really like to live in a disaster. And I kept thinking back to world to Europe before and during the Second World War. And I began to think about the surrealist artists, which I actually wrote about in um, an article that was just published yesterday by Shane. Thank you, and thank you for your wonderful editing in the LA Weekly. Weekly. Uh, so as I said, the, um, the error really reminded me of that, particularly riding around at night and seeing stores with lights on and not a soul around. The state eventually closed, and I began to 
adjust to my new reality in this world and I thought that I would explore what it's like to be a furloughed art writer and what it you know feels like to live um, in a world that's as much a metaphor as a real existence and um, of course I was all the time yearning for the world to return as it was and the art world with the realization that this is not going to happen. I think all agree that when things when this pandemic pandemic is over and who knows when that will be things are going to be very different so i began to think of new opportunities and uh that uh for writing and i as i say i am a news junkie and i've just been reading all kinds of things and two articles that i wrote recently uh that i excuse me that i read recently by christopher knight uh, really impressed me as the kind of articles that I would love to see more of that I think are really important for this time and I think that can help shape the world's view of what the art world is like uh, in the future which I think is going to be very different so in one article he compared Trump to Napoleon uh, who was living during some kind of a pandemic and he used um, he had a first-rate artist paint him as a kind of epic hero, which of course he wasn't, that he could heal, that he had powers of healing. And, and another he wrote, um, I think it just came out yesterday or today, about erecting a memorial plague column uh, to commemorate this plague. And I was just, you know, and then he talked about all kinds of memorial plague columns, you know, throughout the article. But at the end, he said, where should we do it? And he said, uh, New York City at 56th Street, and I think Fifth Avenue, where the Trump Tower is. He said, New York City, because that's where the epicenter of this plague, at least in this country, has been. And he, of course, was, you know, implicitly implying, he was, he was implying that Trump has been a major force in making this a lot worse. He didn't actually say that, but uh, that was the implication. He also talked about co-opting and, and uh, this uh, Trump Tower. So anyhow, that's where I'm at, and I, of course, would love to hear what other people have to say. Um, okay, so we're gonna, what we're gonna do is next we'll uh, talk to, um, how about Jeannie? Talk to us about what you're up to, Jeannie Davis. Um, how's it going? Well, things are going okay. Um, you know, I mean, I, I would echo um, Liz in saying that you know, my initial reaction was, was, you know, just extreme, you know, like a sense of, of loss. I mean, um, it's always just wonderful, you know, to go to, to openings and to see everyone and to, you know, connect with, you know, their art in person. And, um, you know, it's been a big part of my life now for, oh, geez, probably since 2014, um, that arts writing has been a big part of my life. And, you know, Certainly, since 2015, um, every Saturday night, that's that's what I do. I, you know, and and you know, sometimes Sundays, sometimes other nights, um, I go to galleries, I go to openings, I, you know, I I write about them, and um, so you know, I felt really sad about that too. And one of the ways that I have, you know, been coping with with that loss has been to join several wonderful groups um, that have been online. The uncensored artists and photographers, um, I, you know, I'm going to blank on the names of them. They're wonderful groups, though. There's a particularly great photography group. I think it's Photography in, in the Time of the Coronavirus um, is the name of it. It's on Facebook. I can look it up when I'm not talking and, and be able to share that with you guys. Um, and TAM, uh, Torrance Art Museum's um, wonderful um, site, and, you know, their Hobson's Choice and also just their their daily Facebook feed. So it's been nice to connect and see the art in that way. Big shout out to Christine Schumacher for putting together her call and response series where people can participate. Um, in fact, I am participating in the next one that's on Saturday doing uh, poetry to match, uh, you know, some um, uh, works by a really wonderful artist, Adrian Cole. And, um, uh, that I hadn't known before. So it's been another way and I've, I've met some new people that way online. So that's all a good thing. In terms, in, in terms of, of work, I fortunately now, I suppose, as opposed to unfortunately when I wanted all my work to come from arts writing, that is a 
piece of the pie. You know, I, I write for uh, racetrack magazines. I write for retail, um, you know, and amusement park and um, travel and just a wide range of subjects. And I also do copywriting. I also do book editing. I do ghost writing. And really the book coaching and book editing is what I've been doing most of because a lot of people have the time now and the people that have the money to do that are like okay let's do that now so um so i've had so i've had that going so i've had that going on um and you know a lot of memoir stuff and how to books and things like that that people you know want to want to get out there um on the and the arts i have after like sort of being in shock for a while and just trying to keep my other remunerative parts of my business um, going. Um, I have returned to uh, posting two to three times a week for my Diversions LA, um, my own site, which if any of you guys on here are not following it, please follow it. And also please like us on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, anyway, Diversions LA, um, I've been, you know, writing, writing, you know, new stories for them, but not at the volume that I had been, you know, so maybe two to three stories a week on that. But again, th those are primarily labor of love. Sometimes people, you know, will, you know, um, ask me to write about them or, you know, do a piece and would be, you know, paid, but primarily they're, they're labor of love pieces. So I can't do, you know, probably more than that. Um, I've also finished up a few stories for Art and Cake and uh, I've written for Artillery at a Reduced Rate. And, um, you know, that said, I'm constantly, anybody who is, Still hiring people to do arts writing. I am completely open for, for doing that. I love doing it. So, um, you know, yeah. So anyway, so, you know, that's obviously my favorite thing to do, but across the, across the board, I mean, publications such as, you know, in, in the amusement parks, obviously, and travel industry, you know, they either postponed issues or, or cut back greatly. Yeah. And um, I'm still fighting that battle. But, um, you know, um, for now, um, I can hang in there with, you know, the book coaching, the book editing, um, you know, ghost writing and, and, and things like that. Um, a lot of people say, well, why don't you use this time to write one of your own novels? Because it's been so long. But again, that's not going to pay me anything more than yeah. serving the art world. And honestly, I get a lot more personal happiness from being able to um, write things about the art community and support the arts community and and things like that yeah I mean I, I think I think in general um, the strong will survive in this world and the love for the people who survive will grow more I think um, Shana what do you think about as, a, as an editor of a major publications art section, how do you see the, the, the environment, the atmosphere? I mean, there's tons to write about. I mean, LACMA's fiasco, all that kind of stuff. But how does it feel not, how does it feel with thing, the thing that you love the most to write about, I'm assuming, not existing? Like you said in one of our panels the other day when you were, a get, when you were an audience member, how you felt that video was a new avenue to talk about because, you know, I, I just had a long conversation with an artist named Sonia Shank, a lot of you know, last night. And I was in, I said, I, you know, because I'm biased, I said film is gonna save the art world because it's a means to reach people now while people are waiting for something to be put on walls. And so, Writing is, 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 is similar to film in that way because it gives people access to something um, esoteric by the words. So how do you feel, how do you feel this thing is playing out in your, your world? Okay, so there's a lot in there. Um, a couple things, I guess, because you have to start somewhere. So just uh, structurally at the weekly, um, we went into like, um, they, they froze all our freelance budgets and put us at full-time editors on like pretty hardcore reduced hours, um, so that we were eligible for like 
you know, unemployment, but we weren't working zero. And we did that for like a month just to kind of keep it in the game. And like, you know, I'm who I am and I'm sitting in my apartment. So I probably did more than that number of hours, but it was like, a, it, would, it would require like a bigger effort of will to walk away and do nothing when I knew there was something I could be doing. So I made it a way that I felt good about, you know, and we did that for, I guess, what's now the entire month of April, which is now mysteriously over. So um, literally just now, like this week and next week, all the editors are back full time at the weekly. However, our freelance budgets are still frozen. So it's like more, in a way, more work than it was content wise and also super heartbreaking because not only did I enjoy being able to support other voices even in the smallest amount possible um, but also I think the any paper is stronger the bigger the plurality of points of view is so I feel like there's a way in which that's a loss but we are assured that it's temporary right because and the reason for all this is that unlike, say, an, a Times or whatever, or an art newspaper, the LA Weekly is free, which means we do not have a subscriber base. Our income is 100% advertising, period, period. There's no, please subscribe to support us. We're not a nonprofit you can donate to. We are advertising driven. And so a lot of this shit is like force majeure level triage right because that money is just not there and so um that's you know more dire than i meant to make it sound because actually the story of the la weekly is we did not go out of business and we're not going out of business right which is like a miracle in this current print media landscape especially pre indie papers so that's a whole other conversation. Insider baseball, probably interesting, but not for this venue. But just to let you guys know, because I'm sure people have questions, like what's up with that? So that's what's going on. So then the next question is, okay, if I'm full time, what am I gonna write about? Like, what the hell? Exactly, so, yeah. A couple of ways that I, that that is. There's, there is a thing I've been doing on Mondays that, you know, called Meet an Artist, that are these artists profiles been doing it for almost two years people love a year and a half people love it I've been shifting um, because what I had been doing is pegging that usually to an exhibition or a book or something right like meet this yeah. person then go see their show right without that back half it's had to become a little bit more curated but that is you know you know it's always been curated but you know what I mean like I have all the choices in the world now because it's not pegged to anything so that's been really um, interesting for me just because I've been getting to pick people who I kind of know with their work and their answers might speak to the kind of new zeitgeist in a more specific way so I don't I don't feel that that particular column has suffered in fact I think in a way it's become even more um, part of that discourse of those esoteric issues um, and less um, calendar driven so i'm actually liking that um and then to like um i started a couple weeks ago doing um like a, a you know an event we used to do this thing go la that was all the things comedy books whatever resume, blah, blah. i started doing one that's just arts that's all streaming content um or and a couple analog things coming up which we'll talk about um just because i think what happened was there was this initial onslaught of everybody putting everything online holy shit and it was like okay a viewing room is just a nice website so no matter how nice it is i'm looking at jpegs okay mm -hmm. so what can we do to get beyond that because it's good very good to have all that information online so that we can keep up with the programs and the careers and the events and the symposiums and the schedules good please put everything online but as a critic you can't really decide for sure if something's meant to be seen in person 
and you're not seeing it in person, I don't think it's fair to anyone to pronounce its quality. So you have to find another way to kind of offer people things where they can at least learn something, but it's not quite that same art critique dynamic when it comes to object art. So that's a thing. Um, today's print feature, um, feature art is a roundup of galleries and some institutions that I feel like are doing that the best. And this is the second part of your question. It has to do with video. So as the piece says, um, kudos to the galleries and institutions who have figured out that there is a whole historical universe of incredible art film and video work that already exists, that there's a huge amount of contemporary artists using film-based mediums to create new work, that that now includes all your digital animation, VR, AR, 3D technology, all your internet, SEO art, all your web-based art, all of that exists digitally native. It's meant for the digital universe. Maybe you miss some economies of scale if somebody wanted to pr project it billboard size, but basically we're watching it on your computer it is that really truly um, faithful to the intention and the image quality and all that stuff of the original, which was made with those outlets in mind. And so I think at that point, a critic really can decide if something's good on, by watching it on their computer, unlike, say, a new series of paintings or mixed media assemblages or et cetera. So it's really been a question of my priority was to keep the essence of critical evaluation true, which included being able to feel that I've encountered what the artist intended. So that for me is where art historically kind of speaking is where the digital stuff and the film and video based stuff has really saved me from just being sort of like a well-informed calendar editor now, right? Yeah. Yeah. But to, able, to be able to continue to practice proper art criticism, I've turned, and that has not only been something I feel good about sort of ethically and all for those reasons, but it's also been this amazing education for me. So if you look at the paper name, the website has all, is better in this case because it's not, you can't get the paper anyway and put all the links right there. Um, it's like Paris in Paris is putting all these like, Sophie Cal videos online and Roberts until Roberts projects had Aaron Rose curate a festival of hard to see art films and Whitechapel is doing um, an amazing video art archive series and another year in LA has two has two um, seasons worth of avant-garde films that are all linked and you just click through and all this stuff is, I mean, how else are you planning on seeing a rare film that only exists in the archive of the Video Data Bank in Chicago? When were you seeing that? It's online. And so it, to me, there's no compromise when you choose to view art that way. So that's kind of been something that I've been really interested in. And I think I'm gonna continue to go down that rabbit hole because it's been very rewarding. Um, and then finally, and this will be the last thing I say for now, I, um was already maybe i'm just speaking for me here just personal right uh i was already so over the frantic hamster wheel mad dash 35 openings a night or you're a bad person you can't see the damn art anyway because there's 500 fucking people in there and they all want to talk to you so you spend the whole night with your back to the art and by the way if you want to actually experience it or write about it you have to go back when you have the place to yourself to have any chance of really absorbing the content. So I understand that the commercial impact is bad from a gallery point of view, and I'm not without empathy, but just like me living my life, I don't miss that. And I don't miss art fairs one bit. So whatever's coming next, I'm super curious to see what that'll be. But if it involves me being alone in art galleries more often, I'm kind of on board with that. I'm not on board with the reasons for it, 
But to be honest, I don't think a more circumspect, thoughtful, intimate experience of art is a negative. So I don't know if it's a silver lining or if even saying silver is too much since we're so in the midst of a horrible thing that's only gonna get worse. But today we're talking about the dynamics of the art world. And personally, I'm looking forward to something that maybe might exist on a more huge scale um, anyway. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's my thoughts. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, you really, you really are hitting a couple of major points that are really um, resonating with me. Um, number one, shameless plug, the Fine Arts Film Festival is coming up June 8th to the 14th, and there's 91 films about art that you guys might have heard about. Um, it's all going to be online. We had to shift and pivot and get every film online and ask all 91 filmmakers if they'd allow us to do that. It's a huge lift digitally. It's incredible. We have films from all over the world. And, you know, my bias has always been, you know, I was... I was trained at CalArts, so multimedia is the thing. You're, we're trained in theater, dance. Given you are required to have multi -dis, multiple disciplines in your bag of tricks in order to get any recognition or get out of the school, you know what I mean? So the point is, is that I think film is a vital connection point, and I think writing is a vital connection point because one of the things that I've done uh, what, what I've done is um, read more than ever. And I read like voraciously, but I've read more than ever, which means writing is more important to me. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to say is um, Peter Frank is very, I'm not gonna go to him next, I'll go to him after Anne, but Peter Frank has always said this, when he goes into a gallery, spends 30 seconds clocking every piece in the in this in the building and knows it by heart before he leaves always says to the gallery owner i'm going to come back when there's nobody in the gallery so i can really actually experience the work that's sort of peter's mantra and so i agree with you 100 percent. the solitude of looking at a piece of art is key um so Anne. um with all of this stuff we've been talking about in mind, how are you doing? You you came and we talked at my gallery the day before it, the Bendix building shut down. And I have not had access to any of that work in that building, even to look at it or study it or move it around or take pictures of it. I mean, besides what I already did since then. So I'm like desperate for to, to see that again. Um, that's my modus operandi right now. but. How are you doing? What's going on with you? Because you're, you write for a lot of different publications, and you have a very, you know, you have a, your your own unique outlook. So what's what's going on with your writing? Yeah, thanks, Siri. It's um, it's been I guess similar in some ways to what you guys have described, and definitely a lot of things that you touched on resonated with me too. Um, it's, I mean, obviously like the initial impact of like, what's happening? What are we going to do? Cause, um, like Jeannie said, I, I do multiple things. So it's nice, nice is a relative term, but like good to have that kind of diversity of <laughs> things right now. Um, you know, so to balance out like, okay, so we don't have some of the same exhibitions and things to go to or curating projects that I had on, but we've got these other things, whether it's editing or for me, it's, you know, like copywriting or corporate comms. Um, it's not glamorous, but it, it works. Uh, <laughs> there's always a need for just good communication, I think. And that actually um, is probably the main theme of what I've been thinking on these days is art as communication and connection, because that's, to me, the biggest part of it. And so I think it touches on like what Shana was saying about um, using art to to communicate to connect to other folks or whether it's your connection to the piece itself um, and real trying to find ways of still doing that regardless of you know, like whether it's finding a new medium like film to really explore and realize that oh this is something we can still have that relationship with or using it as a way to connect with other people so finding groups or yeah, for me, I guess it's been like talking about not just visual art, but also writing and books and things I've been reading with others, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a larger setting like this and realizing that everyone's kind of 
yearning and reaching for these same things or not not same exactly but wanting to find ways to keep coming together um, and discussing it even if it's not in quite the same way we're used to doing so I think that's been kind of fascinating to explore like how are we finding workarounds and what are the ways that it's it's never going to be quite the same as in person but we're still you know we're sort of endlessly creative about like there's still going to be these other fun things to do so some of the pieces I've been pitching and, and working on have involved that about what are artists doing in lockdown? How are we still keeping our communities active? One was for Shana um, for the weekly early on. And then, uh, and actually, yeah, it's the other thing, the impact this has had on my arts writing work is that I have taken a few more leaps than I might have in other times, just because I realized it's a little bit like there's there's these new opportunities because a lot of us are discovering this at the same time. So yeah, again, silver lining is a is a tough phrase to use, but um, but I was able to kind of reach out to some new editors and relationships or expand beyond just writing about visual arts to say. Um, so I ended up rereading a book uh, that I loved, one of my favorite authors, M. F. K. Fisher, who's actually a food writer, um, and I ended up pitching a piece for that that'll come out soon. It's about um, this was her cookbook that she published during World War II. So it's about rationing and what it was like to experience, you know, the world under these conditions. And I thought, okay, well, you know, what are people looking for in terms of comfort right now? And so looking beyond what, like what we're used to in one medium, but then also thinking there's so many ways to connect. What are these new ones um, that we can find and expand from there? So like seeing it as an opportunity for growth, I think, um, even as it's also, you know, a time to, to pause and take it in and not, not forcing that growth, obviously, but just understanding that whether it's, you know, something is going to come of it, think change will occur. Um, and yeah, being able to take advantage of it as and when we're able to once, once that kind of comes around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, Food, is, I've been involved in a couple of Zoom talks and food is a very common topic of conversation um, about, because, you know, I think a lot of people are spending more time in their kitchens, you know, either cleaning or cooking if they've got that opportunity. Um, and that's a, a really good one because there's nothing better than a good meal with, with friends, you know, when you can gather around a table and shoot the shit. Um, and um, okay, so we have seven minutes left in our 40 minute allotment for the free version of Zoom. So when we go offline, all you have to do is click back on and come back when this thing ends in 40 minutes. So you don't have to, like, just because the screen goes dark, you can click back on don't and come freak back out. Again. Yeah, <laughs> I believe that's yourself. how we've done it before. So I'm trying to keep you guys informed. Now I'd like to talk to our um, eminent uh, person on the list. All of us are eminent, but Peter Frank is a old dear friend from 1981 or two in the, in the New York days. And uh, I'd like to ask you, Peter, how are you doing? I don't believe you're doing any cooking though, but how's your writing going? I make a mean scrambled eggs. <laughs> and so, how do you feel about scrambled eggs in this day, these day, this day and age? Uh, you can overdo it. <laughs> but, uh, speaking of overdoing it, um, I'm as busy professionally as I've as I, I know ever been. I. I have at least half a dozen deadlines to be dealing with right now. I just completed uh, almost as many. Uh, I've been on several, this is like a third or fourth uh, conference I've been involved with in the last two, three weeks. Um, when, the, uh, when the sequestering began, uh, I had just installed an exhibition that I'd curated at uh, Castelli and the artists in that show, yeah. and I, were were so enthusiastic about the show itself. We wanted to make sure people were going to see it somehow because there's no way they could see it live. So we organized a, a couple of um, walkthroughs and a, and a conference, etc. And that was 
that was the uh, latter half of March. In April, there was something else, an exhibition out at Cal State San Bernardino that I'd written for. We had a symposium on that. Um, and that I rec highly recommend uh, a survey of the work of uh, Jan Savka, the Polish American uh, dissident Polish artist who came to America and whose work, at least uh, in San, San Bernardino, is all about California and how he always dreamt of it and deliberately never lived there. <laughs> um, beyond that, uh, this is a great staycation. It's uh, a, a kind of a, an enforced cure for FOMO. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, it, it's working. And I get the feeling that when we come out of this, what's going to be obvious at the, the first thing that's going to be obvious that it's changed is our attitude towards maintaining the discourse itself. Not just the technical stuff like conferences uh, or all the uh, uh, time-based work we're, we're looking at online, but a, a reassessment of the relationship of real art, physically present art, to virtually present art. And we're coming to realize that, okay, we don't want to see an, uh, a, a gallery show online because we want to see the real thing. But if the gallery show is in Berlin, we can't see the real thing so the next best thing is online. And more and more of us are coming to see that there's nothing wrong with that. We wouldn't want to review it for, you know, for an official publication. Um, but to keep up with the information rather than just, you know, seeing things in little, uh, little reproductions in a grid, we blow them up to the size, at least the size of our screen. Um, all the while keeping in mind that it's virtual. It's these, re these reproductions we're looking at, the, all this writing we're reading online is online. And the, there is one level of authenticity that's missing. But now we get to, we, get, we now, recognize it, it's only one level of authenticity that's missing. And uh, if that's the best we can do, that's the best we can do. Yeah, okay, so Jen, not to interrupt, but less than a minute or 40 minutes is gonna be done. So everybody's gonna click back on hopefully. And it might, it might be cut, cut me off in a second, but I don't wanna pay for the upgrade right now that they're asking me to pay for. But. Um, when I was in Estonia this summer, my plane flight was late, was late. And so I had a three hour jurying session out in Pomona that I couldn't attend for the ink and clay show. Um, I was the curator, uh, one of the three curators of that show. And so I had to have somebody walk around the gallery for three hours with a phone. And I would ask the person to point the phone closer to the in, you know, to the part of the sculpture I wanted to see, go around the back of it. And so for three hours, I, I was wonderfully hosted by one of their assistants and managed to get my jurying done without killing my relationship with the dear woman who runs the Kellogg Museum. And, um, and it was a, you know, a necessity, but it taught me a little bit about possibilities. I don't recommend that. I do not, did not like it. But there was the cool moment that I was realizing that I was sitting in front of, in overlooking the city of Tallinn with a beautiful sunset, drinking a nice drink and having dinner while looking at my phone at a piece of art 6,000 miles away that I loved. And I don't know if that's a good model. I don't think that's a model, but that's where this whole, this, the whole thing reminds me of that. It's not a model, it's not a good professional model, but it's a good model for